welcome to the Seattle Public Utilities Green Gardening Program Winter Workshop. We have an exciting group of speakers today who are here to talk to you about water management essentials. So not just irrigation, um, but water management. Water management's a big challenge in today's landscape. It's increasingly important for our landscapes to be more functional than ever. Not only do they need to be beautiful and water efficient, but they also have to manage polluted stormwater, restore habitat, provide erosion control, sequester carbon, and more than that. All the while, meeting the social and physical needs of the people who use them. So this added complexity can make it hard to know what each of our roles is with regard to water management and when and how to connect to our colleagues to ensure that the landscapes are the most effective they can be. To help answer these questions, we've brought together a mix of leading industry professionals to talk to you about their roles, experiences, lessons learned, and inspirations in creating and managing the functions of landscapes today. Well, first off, how many people here really like plants? Because you know, not everybody does. All right, enough. Um, Several years ago, when we were doing um, more and more design work that was sort of the doing the right thing part of uh, sort of maybe a, a bit of a new wave of, of garden design, we found some very interesting things. A lot of people wanted to do the right thing, but what really got them doing it was in Portland, it is not uncommon to have a three to $400 water bill. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of dying camellias and a lot more ceanothus out there than there used to be. So what that sort of led me to thinking is that sometimes if you ever joined a plant society or any other group, they're all sort of, um, the personalities are those that either founded them or the era, era in which they were started, that kind of thing. Sometimes, I mean, bamboo society wants you to make your floors and build your house and paint your walls with bamboo and, and maybe grow some also. And sometimes the native plant world, for instance, can be a little punitive. We've been very bad people we're a bad society, let's plant natives. And part of that movement can be, if the garden's actually pretty, then we're having too much fun. It should be a little, again, a little, a little off. So I would like to say, and the plants I'll show you here, they're not all natives, but they're all summer drought adapted and quite a few Western natives. And that is, when I say Western native, anywhere west of the Cascades, the Sierra, from Northern Baja to Victoria, for the most part, things that go through a long period of summer drought, and we can grow most of those plants. So coming along and thinking, oh look, it's a native landscape, which means it loses its leaves in the winter and it catches litter. There's, there's a lot more to it than that. So what I'll do here is just show a mix of things, and hopefully by the end, you'll either be fast asleep or, or think that some of these techniques and some of these plants are not punitive, but actually we can use natives and other things almost as if they were real plants. So if I could have the lights, that would be great. So first of all, some of the concepts, um, and I'm glad I have the prompts this morning. It isn't rocket science. Part of it is if you're using water-wise plants, there are just a few simple rules that I really suggest thinking about. And one, it's tough love. If you're trying to keep, and especially down in our area with the hot summers, if you're trying to keep a rhododendron alive, or Viburnum davidii looking good in the landscape. There are a lot of things you have to do, but using one, a lot of evergreen plants, so the ground is covered as much as possible. You're keeping the ground cooler, you're keeping moisture in, and most importantly, you're keeping the winter growing weeds, and most of our weeds are winter growing, from taking over the landscape. And low nutrients, I think that's the other key thing. Many of our Western plants grow in relatively poor soils, so basically, if you can force yourselves or your clients to neglect the garden, you're gonna have a lot better garden using low water and native plants. So basically, it's easy, but if you nurture the plants, you often nuke them. So it's, that's probably the, the, the most important rule. I always like to show a couple of pictures of our own design work, um, just to give you a couple of ideas if you, if you need them. So, for a long time, for, and for a lot of us, this was the idea of a drought-tolerant landscape. And 
there it is. Um, that plum tree has lived there for years. This is in southeast Portland, uh, going deciduous about every July and somehow mostly leafing out, out again the next spring. And what is the definition of insanity? Repeating a mistake and expecting different results. So they went pretty, pretty extensive landscape redo and unfortunately used the same types of plants, which are again dead. So that happens. This was actually a, a spot on our own Savi Island, just north of, of Portland. And it was technically uh, a bus and public transit turnaround, technically a native landscape. A native, I don't know where, I 7,000 feet in the Cascades, I guess. So an entire landscape, um, this was what was alive after the end of the first summer. That's one Oregon oak there that has a couple of green leaves. So we really have to think about the actual site in which we're planting. And what I'm finding is that a lot of places that we're thinking, all right, it's a bioswale. Well, have you ever noticed that we tend to just slightly over-engineer bioswales for the 900 inches of rain we don't get here? And so either the bioswales are completely water-free both summer and winter, or you forgot that, oh, that's a car dealership and they wash their pavement every day and you've got a swamp. So knowing what they call the edaphics is, is kind of an important thing. Quercus garyana, in case you need to know what it looks like. Um, another thing we need to think about, and I don't know what the stats are in Seattle, but in Portland we are building bioswales incredibly quickly. And it is, it is likely we'll actually have more need for city staff maintaining bioswales than city parks. And that's something, that's a real number, that's something we sort of have to think about. We're creating spaces that need, that need care, so what are they doing for us? And this is actually in my own neighborhood, uh, some good species, but it is a wonderful catch-all for Clematis vita alba and Himalayan blackberry. And if we don't keep track of that, then we're gonna, I guess we could say we're building wildlife habitat, but we've got to be careful. Here, um, this is January, a couple of years ago, um, just showing most of those are just winter growing uh, invasive weeds, as opposed to non-invasive weeds. What do you plant around a bioswale, for instance? Portland is the queen city of rings of dead Nandina around bioswales. So, you know, think about where they come from and think about coverage, think about if somebody backs over them, will they re-sprout or are they brittle? All kinds of things like that. Um, this, I believe, is and or was a spirea planted about 4,000 feet too low. So you can see the job it's doing in, in suppressing the weeds around it. But you can see, I think, on the right there, there's a little red, that's fall color. So at least there's, you know, there's something to it. But uh, yeah, there's the fall color. I just wanted to get a close up there. So anyway, it's, you know, by looking at our own mistakes, it's a very good thing. And they're growing a really good dock, by the way. So by looking at what we've done um, and maybe are, are not so proud of it, it's, it's, by the way, no, this is not mine. But. And here, this is uh, Kinnikinnik. It's the one manzanita that in our part of the world really does horribly. Um, so, and that's what they planted 99 and two thirds of all bioswales, apparently. Uh, most importantly, if you're using, for instance, a ground cover manzanita and it's Kinnikinnik or Uber Ursi, it's the only manzanita that leaves the West Coast and it goes circumboreal, which is not going into a crowded post office, but um, growing across the entire higher latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. So many of them with um, cultivar names like Massachusetts, a little hint there, aren't really very adapted to our periods of summer drought. So if you're going to plant Uber Ursi, make sure it's brilliant to one of the West Coast cultivars that sort of have that ability to survive drought. And most of our Western Uber Ursis have uh, manzanitas. It's kind of a specialty of ours. They like to play around a lot. So you see them at a lot of parties and they have a lot of love children. And what that means is there are a lot of great hybrids out there with really well adapted species. So think West. So what are we doing, all of us in the room, when we are looking or, or interacting with a client, whether it's public or private, we're trying to convince them that the pictures they see, and of course, sometimes you, uh, on the inner tubes, you look up a uh, drought tolerant parking lot, and half the time you get like, you know, the Massachusetts Water Conservation Department or something like that. Oh, I'll plant birches. So again, thinking west, 
and we're convincing people to look at plantings in another direction. Golden is not brown, and that's a very important thing to remember. Our grasses turn a beautiful golden in the spring and summer. And I think if you can convince people that these are kind of the colors of the West, that, that's not a bad thing. So we're doing a little conversion therapy here, if we're, if we're good. I'm also going to talk here about a lot of plants. So um, I was talking to someone earlier, and we'll, we'll sort some plants people here, because other people might be enthused, and others I'll see little narcolepsy things happening here and there. Um, and I also encourage heckling, um, you know, kind of nice heckling, but um, I want to show you some plants here also. When we're looking at things like um, just simply coverage, there are obviously good techniques, planting on center, jute coverings and things like that, for instance, the bottom of a bioswale. But things like juncus, the rushes, are absolutely amazing. A lot of species, patens for us is really good because it's kind of a clumper and it's native throughout most, most of California, the Willamette Valley, and you can keep kind of a pattern going and it doesn't spread where you don't want it to. It also can take amazing summer drought or sit in water, and there's not a lot of plants that can do that. And again, here coming in some really good color forms, and it's evergreen, um, and it makes you look about 10 years younger. So it's a, it's a very good plant. Another great plant, it's a coastal sedge. This one spreads a bit, but again, blue and really pretty. And these are things that we're using in the bottom of bile swales, especially and they simply cover ground. They don't leave room for things like blackberries, and they filter water very, very well. The same with a lot of our Western native carex species. These are all grassy things. This tends to be, depending on the cultivar you get, evergreen will grow in the winter and really, really green. It actually makes a good turf, believe it or not. So you can get that nice sort of wavy, tussocky look or a shorn lawn. This is another plant that we've used on the steeper banks of bioswales, particularly good in shade under shrubs. That's something we often miss, that we've got this great specimen shrub that's grown over time, and it's got all those naked knees on the underside, and then you start getting weeds growing up. And often public agencies don't have the resources to garden public spaces. So I know uh, there's a freeway along in Portland that had a great Mediterranean landscape 30 years ago, but if you spray a big leaf maple from 50 feet with Roundup, you kind of get some stuff around it too. And so if you're sort of um, eliminating the possibility of weeds taking off, that's not a bad thing. A lot of great uh, plug and grass nurseries out there as well. Some things that are not at all native, this is a South African restio, and there are a number, this is actually growing in Victoria. Beautiful plants, great for bottoms of bioswale and give you really good texture in the distance. That's about six or seven feet tall. So what happens when there's a little mistake made, either sometimes mine, sometimes somebody else's? This is a local um, building that was, they wanted to be sort of lead Berkeleyum, and they were, we got to work with the landscape from the very beginning, from the colors of the building to every plant in the landscape. The drawings have very nice mounds between all of these places that car, car, uh, created little courtyards. In reality, the city came in and said, mm -mm, these are bioswales. So I thought, well, what do we do? That was my first uh, use of what I call an undulating swale. Often you'll see in drawings, water from whatever surface flows into essentially a ditch in a straight line and goes someplace. If you can undulate those swales, it's a very good use of one, it's slowing water, but also you're creating mounds between the swales and then you can plant other things. So you, you get the height. There aren't that many, for instance, trees that really like to grow with winter inundation. So here we have choicea, one of the Mexican mock oranges, a fig from Afghanistan, and a yucca from Mexico that we selected a number of years ago growing in a bioswale. And they love the water. The yuccas have been growing about 18 inches or two feet of trunk a year. So this is four years later and the yuccas are about 10 feet. So it's kind of fun to think, as a friend of mine says, think outside the box. But if you're doing, we do a lot of these on green roofs because again, sometimes green roofs are just giant bile swales. There are so many great camases and once they're established, they just keep, um, keep spreading. And here, in anywhere in the grasslands, like the, uh, the prairies from Tacoma South, Lamont Valley and other places, you get some of the um, little iris relatives and of course poppies and other things. They're good plants and we try to use a lot of things also that are nitrogen fixing. 
a wild orchid selected in Northern California, purple leaves, and kind of an obscure thing that I'd like to see less obscure, an Arthesium. That will be on the quiz later. Um, it starts flowering in April or so and keeps going through midsummer, then has beautiful golden inflorescences. It will grow in standing water and then it can completely dry out in the summer. This is a Siskiyou Mountain native. It's a pretty thing. And again, for the bottoms of some of these places that are seasonally really damp, this is uh, sort of a Burgenia relative on steroids, Darmera peltata, native from about central western Oregon, south. Does lose its leaves in the winter, but early in the season, about this time of the year, it has these great, very tall Burgenia like flowers and leaves that look like little gunneras. So it can actually be used, and I think a lot of people have probably used it. It was once more common, has fallen out of favor, and now it's just coming back a little bit. Close with the flowers here. And rhododendro. Interesting. I must have done these. Uh, <laughs> must have done these captions. I type with my left hand. Um, I'm not a rhododendron fan, and it's just I don't know. It was the way I was raised, but. There are some very good rhododendrons that are actually very low maintenance. We can't get away with oversummering them as well in our part of the world, even in established gardens. I think in, in Seattle on the North Wall with good mulch and other, other things, you can, you can get them through the summer with very low irrigation a little better. This is rhododendron occidentale from the west coast, from northern Oregon to Baja. It is deciduous and it, the, it just this intense fragrance. So if you ever, you've ever used the Mollus azaleas, a lot of those hybrids have occidentally blood in them. Not only are they really fragrant, but good fall color, and often um, they'll flower again in the fall about the same time as some of our dogwoods do. It's actually a nice garden feature. Calicanthus, western spicebush. Deciduous, really good late fall color no matter what. Also can grow at the bottom of a bioswale. And it, it has a very interesting, you know, how some plants have fragrance and some, I guess you could say they have odor. This one smells like a really good red wine in the morning when I guess I have my first red wine. I don't know about you. Um, by noon, if it's hot, it starts smelling like Elmer's glue. So you really want to do your morning, morning stroll, you know, with this plant. But uh, they can flower all summer. It's good. Only three species, one in Florida, one in Vietnam, and one on the West Coast. And things like you know, some beautiful uh, madrones around here. It's just a wonderful West Coast icon. Unfortunately, it's a plant that if you make direct eye contact, it, it tends to die. So um, if you plant them only in invisible public spaces, they're much better. What, what we find is this is a poster child for uh, a plant that needs West Coast conditions. And that is really inorganic soil and very little in the way of, of interaction. Really, once you get going, it they, get going with it. They can, they can, they can even take poor drainage. Um, we had a beautiful specimen in our garden. One day it was 104 degrees. The irrigation came on that was supposed to be completely off. Two days later, it was that olive color, and it just, it just went away. There are some other species as well to look at that come from the Intermountain West. They can take a little bit of garden water, but basically leaving it alone, and. This is sort of a cue to talk a tiny bit about um, taking care of a garden that tends to have a lot of Mediterraneans or a lot of native plants. Um, really, the, the key there is that they grow in mineral soils, meaning you know how some gardens with a lot of trillium and hellebores pile on the poop every year and it's, it's sort of a tradition? Well, our natives just can't handle that. So what happens is you get all this organic matter, you've got lots of fungal stuff going on, and the, it's okay in the winter when everybody's metabolism is low. When the soil warms in the summer and there's any moisture added, those fungi attack the plant's roots, which are native, and they kick the bucket often. But if the soil is lean, then you just don't have that much trouble. So again, another example of tough love and the need for it. So we all know what madrones look like. Whole bunch of western oaks. I've gotten a little bigger here, and we have a great deal of sort of, um, I would say, differences between our urban forestry people and designers and those that really want to see our streets, well, beautiful. I've always thought that because we planted so many eastern trees in our cities, we kind of made ourselves look a little bit like Detroit. 
you know, wind whistling down the sidewalk, nothing but gray deciduous trees. And there are a lot that are broadleaf evergreens, which are, are things I really love. This is the interior live oak, Quercus quislazini. If it's got good drainage, it's easy anywhere on the west coast. And if you're doing either a parking lot or even an LA along the street, if you plant two or three broadleaf evergreen trees that don't lose their leaves in the winter, suddenly that street looks every bit as beautiful as Charleston uh, with those beautiful live oaks, and it brings green through the entire winter. To me, that's really important. And here, this is actually east of the east of the Cascades. This is our native Quercus gariana turning color in November. And there are a lot of other cool oaks to just look for. I, I think my Dex bumper sticker is going to be oaks are the answer because there are so many of them and so many of them are well adapted. One I wouldn't use, for instance, the, um, the pin oak and the red oak, which are most commonly available in the nurseries. Um, Quercus, Rober, English oak, those are all Latin for trees that look ugly in the landscape, if you translate them. Um, in our part of the world, having a tree that in the Midwest is the only texture they can have. Here, a tree that has, it's all full of dead leaves all winter, just basically looks like your landscape died. And I, I kind of feel the same way about some of the native grasses. Some good examples of oaks. The silver oak, which is now slowly more available. Evergreen, beautiful reflective leaves. Uh, very, very periodic drought tolerant. We're also looking at other oaks that have beautiful fall color that stays through the winter. So you're actually getting um, a little bit of brightness through the winter months. In Portland, often our only winter color in the street trees are liquid ambars. And the forestry department is now at war with them because they live they lift sidewalks. So anyway, just a few others here. So again, just thinking, of course, all these things, if there you want a plant that's happy and not too happy, you want a plant that's well adapted to our environment and low input. You also don't want one that's gonna become broom and escape up the nearest hillside. So there are always a few things to think about. And of course, right tree, right place as they say. So we have a lot of natural sort of occurrences on the West Coast, and part of it is a lot of our plants are fire adapted. What does that mean? Uh, after the Berkeley fire, we did a, a bunch of information for the local um, water agency. They confused fire adapted with fire retardant. And so this pamphlet came out full of things that you just get near them with a match and the oils explode into flame. And that was sort of, no, that's not what we were thinking. So if you're, uh, Seattle isn't quite as prone to wildfires as we are, but there are years that things get really crispy. So things that are fire retardant, good. Fire adapted, look carefully. But one nice thing is that a number of our Western natives, for instance, because a fire does occasionally come through, they have what's called a basal burl. Basically, you know, in uh, expensive cars, you see the dashboards made out of them like walnut wood. They will re-sprout from anything. And what I call those plants are O dot or, or was it WS dot or Caltrans proof, meaning the worst um, maintenance can happen to them and they will regenerate. And that to me is, is very important. Unfortunately, with budgets, almost all of our um, freeway maintenance now comes from the local jail, and they haven't always had the best horticultural training. Good with chainsaws and knives, so they prune things in knife boxes, but um, anyway, a dwarf oak, a cute little thing, only gets about knee-high, evergreen, western native, and again, if you're looking at the native hillsides, and for instance, you're doing, people tend to get almost all the knowledge they have about gardening, if they're just getting into it, from the local parking lots. So once you realize that basically it's Home Depot where people learn how to garden, and it's not the garden center, it's out in the parking lot, you, you start thinking, all right, what are they seeing? So echoing what's around. We use a lot of ceanothus, or the California lilacs, or the, the blue bush in our landscapes for a number of reasons. They're easy. If you don't take care of them, they live for a very long time, and they fix nitrogen. And the nice thing to know that if your nitrogen is broken, it's a very good thing to have a plant like this because you don't need to use, you really don't need to anyway in our soils, but you don't need to use chemical fertilizers if you place things in the ramnus or the pea family throughout the landscape. And 
So why not create your own fertilizer? This is in the Columbia Gorge, one of our good native ones. Named after friend at the University of California Botanic Garden, this is a great plant, about waist high. And now that we have a nursery on an island where we're surrounded by organic weed patches with blueberries and things tucked in between them, we realize that we really need tough ground covers, so more like impenetrable. So for me now, a ground cover isn't a foot tall anymore. It is like waist high. And that's what Kurt Zadnik is, long towering. Little guy, this, this will be named soon. This only gets an inch tall, but will spill over walls. So what I'm thinking, what I'm saying here is look for Ceanothus because there's so many good ones. Um, and again, since people learn a lot about what they're doing from parking lots, I think it's very important to sort of be a little introspective and realize we have to find plants that will do this, apparently, without too much pruning. This is a, a, a manzanita and a ceanothus, in case you can tell. And uh, uh, it, it always needs to be said as you're, as you're training people, don't do this. No matter what else you're doing, don't do that. So where are we going from here? More natives, more drouter, drought-loving things. Um, a favorite, the manzanitas, the Arctostaphylus. There are so many um, from Uversee to the others. A lot of them are small trees. What we're also finding is that in, say, parking lot landscapes, in, in general areas that you just sort of are, you know are going to have minimal maintenance, but you want them to look good, things that become miniature trees are great. A few years ago, I started realizing that if somebody came into the nursery and we said, this is a shrub to eight to 10 feet tall, what does that conjure in your mind, something that's just eaten half your garden. If we say this is a miniature tree to eight or ten feet tall, people shriek with delight. So it's all about what you're telling people as well. Some of these manzanitas, you know, if people don't want a giant madrone in their garden, how about Arctostaphylus manzanita? Beautiful little tree, 15 feet, wonderful bark, evergreen leaves, they flower all winter. I mean, you really can't get better than that. Great pollinator plants. This is the creature flowering in the wild at the end of, end of December. It smells like honey, cleans your floors, all of that kind of stuff. The gray manzanita, another wonderful plant, spigula native of Southern Oregon. Um, and this is near Mount Hood, actually, a population of natural hybrids. It is very fun to go into the wild and look for variation in these things. There are four species here that have wild parties and uh, here we go, it's kind of, and again, this is in the wild as well, just all a mixed manzanita stand. So the nice thing is if you can put these creatures in a landscape and not necessarily spec, I want 400 Howard McMinns, I want 900 by Burnham Davidi eyes, all, you know, four feet on center, but you can say, give me some variation here. You, you have a much healthier population of plants, things are less disease prone, and I frankly think they look a lot better. Again, just sort of, this is a, in the Siskiyou Mountains, these are all native broadleaf evergreens that we could all and should all be using. This is, this is Brody, the wild Oregon wolf. I don't know if you heard of OR7 when he was wandering around. He was really Brody. And that is a, an Arctostaphylus we selected uh, several years ago, now called Hoodview. Unfortunately, um, these are under high tension lines that cross the Cascades from Bonneville Dam near Lolo Pass. They have done the most, talk about Yellow Brick Road, the most wonderful job in spreading broom. I took pictures last year of a beautiful golden stripe going over the hills as far as you could see. And um, their eradication techniques have been wiping out all the manzanitas, but apparently promoting the broom. And on the east side here, uh, the green manzanita, it actually crosses with our native blue Columbiana that everybody seems to want to use. Unfortunately, that is the most cootie prone. And cootie's a technical term. I don't know if you all have had that. Um, but it's black spot on a stick. So some of the hybrids are much more garden adapted. And the, here they are together um, east of Mount Hood. And again, this is in January. So you get good winter color. One of our gardens, this is the Von Schlegel residence, about 1,500 feet above Portland State. There's Portland over there. So not directly above it. It's actually on a hillside. But we used, it's a three acre garden. And it's almost entirely Western natives. We invented a term called Willamette Valley Iconic because they wanted us to invent a term. But lots of silvers, lots of mahogany colors of barks. 
you get a lot more manzanitas. Again, winter color. Our native Arctostaphylos columbiana with some great wild huckleberries. I'd like to see these used a bit more. We found this in the Siskiyous. It's a Vaccinium ovatum, the small evergreen huckleberry. This only gets about 18 inches tall. It, I, embarrassingly, somebody said it looks like red, crib, red pygmy barberry. So it's kind of ruined it for me for a little bit, but anyway, just a few more of these things. So Umbelliolaria, you know, the, um, uh, the, or the California Bay, Oregon myrtle that seeds into your neighbor's garden and becomes 400 feet tall. Um, there are dwarf ones and they are amazing uh, sort of public area and dry garden plants. They only get about waist high to shoulder high, easily pruned, nice little yellow flowers in the winter, really good color. We have a native Styrax on the west coast, believe it or not. Very good and easy, grow, easy to grow plant. Western, Western redbud with some of the, the coffee berries, the ramnus, are also just good, easier to find. So this is uh, again in the Siskiyous. I think that's a really handsome plant. And they're easy, they can actually take some inundation and can dry up completely in the water. The garrias, the silk tassels, a lot of good ones around. Um, to some degree, especially uh, the coast silk tassel, Garia elliptica, how many of you have used that plant? or have seen it, have decided not to use it, there are lots of hands going up and down. Um, it does get a little winter spotty, and of course native plants always get two points for being native no matter what. That's a plant that I say is really perfect for your neighbor's garden, because you get to see it from a distance and they look at the black spots, and I think that's a win-win situation. Um, a little garia from the Siskiyous, Buxifolia, silver undersides to the leaves, very evergreen. They should plant these instead of having freeway reflectors. But again, once you can get them, very, very easy. The underside of the leaf there. And again, all these guys are evergreen. Native tan oak, the dwarf one, with very blue leaves. And mahonias. Oregon grape has sort of given mahonias a, a bit of a bad name, planting kind of mountain plants in the, full, in the full sun. But there are a bunch of western ones that are really, really nice. Some of them can be a little owy, but, but they're good texture and good color. Evergreen. Plums. This one doesn't quite make it this far north. It's more of a Siskiyou south, but think uh, think eight feet, evergreen, tasty fruit, although it's a big seed and not much fruit. Prunus And these are some, some new genetics to kind of bring into our landscape and very, very easy. So ribes, if you, as they say, keep up with current events, current and ribes, sorry. Um, there are a lot of good ones, and that's just to keep me from falling asleep. Ribes speciosum, this is a central California one. In a mild year like this one, it began flowering with the first rain and has been going all winter long. It's full tilt boogie right now. And then it'll actually have fall color in June and go dormant for a while and be nothing but a big pile of spines. And that's another thing that clients kind of need to be thinking about, that much of our Western landscape is to some degree summer dormant. And brown, again, is, is pretty. It's not brown, it's golden. This is a, a hybrid between our golden flowered currant and our red flowering currant called Ex Gordonianum. Long flowering, kind of Shirley Temple colors, sort of mustard going to peach, going to pink. Easy, easy plant. And a southern ribes called Malvasium. It begins flowering in December, sometimes even November, and goes all winter long. So you can really stretch the flowering season of these things. Some of the perennials, Oregon sunshine, Eriophyllum lanatum, when we selected a number of years ago, silver rosettes really does knit the ground very well. So if you're using this on the on fairly steep slopes, it's good. Flowers for about two months, then shear it once and you get silver leaves the rest of the year. Lots of milkweeds. Try those and attract butterflies. And some of the ephemerals. These are for gardens that maybe have a little bit more attention. The lomatiums, the carrots, are really cool plants. They're called desert parsleys. A lot, I think we have over 60 species native to the west. This is columbianum. It makes, think of bright blue parsley that emerges in November, flowers in February with really good, almost burgundy flowers, and then by the end of March or April, completely disappeared. 
So if you've got them growing through ground cover manzanitas or something, they make a flash and then they're gone, kind of like bulbs. And available from native plant nurseries. So not bad things. And silvers are never bad in a landscape. This is a fireweed, but it, fall, it flowers in the fall. And again, tucking these little guys and sedums. Sedums are now the answer to just about everything under your under your oaks. But be have some fun with the sedums. There are a lot of western ones, a lot of them from the Mediterranean, and they do cover ground well. The main thing, by the way, with sedums, if any of you are involved in, for instance, green roof or green wall construction, we have a phenomenon going on on the west coast that is buy it from you know cedar floor or someplace and it's just a mass of sedums that you get to plant in these places half of them are summer rainfall asian sedums a lot of them lose their leaves in the winter and half of them are western natives that need summer drought so what do you do with those you plant the sedum roof you water it like crazy for the first summer or two thereby killing all the western sedums then now that they're established you stop the irrigation and kill all the asian sedums and then what's that ground cover poa annua is really a nice cover for a roof so kind of be thinking where these things come from and go do that from the start these plants especially natives i like to think of as puppies um, one if plants need what they need if it's a summer rainfall rhododendron you've got to keep watering it there's no such thing as establishment you don't get a puppy and only feed it the first day and think it'll be okay for the rest of its life. And you also, with a native plant, don't leave a puppy in a hot car and go into the mall. You've got to always know what they need. <laughs> Sorry for the image there. But... So a, a, a few things, these are by no means native, but the upper estrada I showed earlier, really good form, so easy to grow. Here it is in that bioswale with the Afghan fig behind. And again, even for containers, these things are low ebb. We've been playing around with Mexican mock oranges. They can take amazing amounts of periodic drought. This is like one or two irrigations during the summer, and that's it. And I like cacti. I'll admit that. And I think um, part of middle age is you either get a, get a sports car or you get back into succulents that you liked when you were a kid. So if I ever get to middle age, I'm really going to get back into these things. Now we're doing a lot of opuntias and a lot of grasses. This is the coyote bush. It's not actually a Seattle area native. It grows, strangely enough, from the tip of the spit near Astoria all the way into Baja, but for some reason isn't north of it. But it's a, it's a big daisy on a stick. It's an evergreen shrub. There are ground cover forms. What I love about this thing is if you're thinking about year-round color and also year-round pollination for native insects, the bee, the European bee, I know it's been on the decline, the European bees have actually displaced a lot of our native ones. So encouraging things that are for our native pollinators, it's not a bad idea. What I'm finding is that Bacchus flowers three or four times a year, flowers all through December and January. And if it's 45 degrees outside, the, the European bees are kind of, if they're out at all, they're just kind of crawling around thinking, why am I here? But a lot of the native pollinators are, yay, it's 45 degrees, let's pollinate something. So you will see a major party on one of these things in the, in, with insects you've never seen before, all, all good ones. It does have a fragrance that also might be a little bit of an odor, so understand that it smells a lot like Grandma's Attic, kind of, um, well, I don't know, full of old magazines. You'll have to experience for, it for yourself, but, but good plants. The close-up of the, uh, the flowers, which you can also do is plant male clones so you don't get the, the seeds blowing around. A Mediterranean. This is a lotus relative, it's a pea. This is one of our universal knitters. We use this on green roofs, in perennial gardens. It is mounding and silver and evergreen, kind of light pink flowers and then chestnut colored seed pods. Fixes nitrogen and covers ground. And, you know, if you're thinking of biological controls, there are a lot of ways to do it. This is actually along the coast in Northern California. These people do not have a landscape. I thought it was kind of <laughs> unfortunate. I also thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> so, you know, eventually we all come to the end of our wits, don't we? Anyway, just a, a few uh, native monkey flowers here. The shrubby ones are very good for, again, woody plants that stay evergreen in the winter. Some really good new flowers coming out. I'm a big fan of Zoshinaria. 
the California fuchsia, also called epilobium by some. They begin flowering even without water in late June or July and keep going until hard frost. This year we have a lot of plants still in flower in the garden. The hummingbirds are attracted from thousands of miles away, but very good plants. And I, I happen to like screening orange. We use Wayne Silver a lot on roofs. Good for sweeps of color. This is a, a green roof we did a number of years ago in, in Portland. And uh, you know, why not have one of your projects vi visible from space? And this is back in the Von Schlegel garden. We're aiming to make this almost a completely non-irrigated garden. We water it three times a summer and that's it. And it's, it's worked out all right. Hopefully you can see that all right. Native iris, use them because we can and the rest of the world can't. Evergreen, so they have really good quality all year. Because face it, iris flower for about 20 minutes, so it's worth having something that has really good foliage at the same time. Some native ones here. This is one we're calling band and strain. It actually almost has the appearance of a New Zealand flax. Thick, waist high, very, very good garden presence, and very drought tolerant. So you get the idea, lots of color. Leave it to the British to do a better job with our natives than we do. This is the Chelsea Flower Show. So you can have some fun with it. Some dwarf oaks. This is Sadleriana. This is only in a few obscure places in the Siskiyou Mountains, but now much more available. How about an oak tree with that looks like a loquine? Six inch leaves, waist high or so, and very, very evergreen. And not difficult to grow. And under them, uh, Oxalis oregano. Some people love it and some people hate it because if you have a, a rock garden, it does tend to sort of take over a bit. But the native or the evergreen forms from along the coast are very good to use because they will just make a beautiful carpet in the deepest of shade. Redwood sorrel. The same with a lot of the polypodiums. We see them in the trees. If people are all right with them going a little crispy and golden in the summer, they're very, very good textures. And someday we'll be able to reproduce these trillium enough that we can have them as massive ground covers. Uh, in, in, until now, we've just had to use them in um, select clients' gardens. The same with a lot of the gingers. So sorry for the uh, massive plants here, but for the most part, it's just to make you realize, if you don't already, that there are so many plants out there to use, and they're very, very functional. One thing we don't see very often anymore in gardens Old-fashioned gardens had a lot of naturalized things. The cyclamen, there are two main species. Heterofolium tends to flower from August through the mid-fall, and then coum, C-O-U-M, tends to go from uh, late autumn to early spring. Naturalizing, making great color, good leaf forms. Here, growing in the Von Schlegel garden from a ground cover of Ceanothus. So the nice thing is, we've, we've had a little campaign at the nursery aimed at the design community. And, you know, we've really been building, as you know, with all the skyscrapers or going up and the cranes both, both of our cities have in the air, that we are really building densely now. As a friend of mine said in Portland, trees, we won't have room, we're building Manhattan. So everything we're building, I think, has to be a little more special. We're kind of feathering our nests now. We're not just trying to fill vast acres of land. So our little campaign is let's make the pedestrian experience not a pedestrian experience. And so much modern architecture and modern plantings. Let's, well, let's do 65 bamboos here in gravel. Well, people are gonna pass out from boredom by the, before they get to the end of the block. So let's have a few special things. Let's make sure there's fragrance. Let's make sure there are little surprises. You don't even have to tell the client they're there. Just plant five cyclamen bulbs in a ground cover and they'll do the rest. Or they'll spray them with Roundup, but you know. <laughs> anyway, just good texture here. I like skunk cabbage, and they actually naturalize fairly well, better for you than for us. Um, I was coming over from a client on the coast a couple of years ago. We were just finishing up, and I thought, oh, I'll take a different route through the coast range. So there I was in March, and I realized I, I saw a great swale of these on a rural road with my trunk open, and I had actually taken lime over in some plants. So the trunk's open, and I've got a shovel, bags of lime, and tarps and I'm crawling off into the woods. And I thought, what if the sheriff stops me? <laughs> I'm going to have a tough time explaining. But uh, anyway, some pictures out of the deal. 
and a few of the, the winter or fall flowering bulbs, Nerini, like with the cyclamen, they're not used as much as they used to be. So how about planting, this is a South African, it's not native, but really well adapted. Plant these things, let them go, and when you least expect it, September, October, November, these flowers come out of the woodwork with very little in the way of effort. And grevilleas, just one more shrub here. They're Australian, and there's some that do very well for us. This is uh, sunbird adapted, so they're like hummingbirds that don't hover. They just kind of sit there, and uh, so most of these things have little branchlets that the birds can land on. This thing starts flowering in October and goes for the entire winter, so it's a really good plant. It's been amazingly hardy. Another great little hypericum used to be, and still are things that are used on the freeways. There was a committee that got together and selected the ugliest one possible to use, and maybe they thought, well, they won't steal these. But there are really nice ones. This is, this is Olympicum, long flowering period, and it's not my least favorite color of yellow. Anyway, Bolymiums, they're cystis relatives, or rock roses. Again, they can be short-lived, but really good instant color for not much money. And really, if we're continuing to try to convert people, then using these plants, having them perform, is really going to be the way to go.